Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Niamh McLuckley. She is a lecturer in developmental psychology at the University of Kent. She studies how social information impacts young children's cognition, evaluations, and behavior. So Dr. McLuckley, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Happy to be here. Yeah, so let's start with this. How, how early can you study the impact of social information on children? I mean, I guess that generally my question would be at what point during child development do children start being start paying attention and being influenced by social information? So I think, first of all, I would argue um, that you know, children are exposed to social information as soon as they enter the world. So they're immediately interacting, perhaps on a very basic level, with their parents and their caregivers. Um, and this, thus it is technically possible to study the influence of social information on newborns even. Um, for example, researchers have run studies on newborns' imitative behaviour. So I'm thinking specifically of a longitudinal study that my a previous colleague of mine, Janine Ostenbrook, uh, conducted with her, with her team. And they were looking at the propensity of newborns um, as young as one week old uh, to imitate other people's actions, such as things like protruding their, their tongue or making a sad face or grasping actions. Um, so yeah, we can look at these kind of basic behaviors, but in saying that even if newborns are being exposed to social information, it does not mean that um, studying the effect of this on their cognition is an easy feat. I think this is a, a major challenge for developmental researchers. Um, and one way that we have, or they have, I haven't actually done much in, in infant research. Um, one way they've addressed this challenge is to focus on indicators of cognition that rely on the development of certain biological and perceptual abilities such as vision. So a common method in infant research um, is to measure their looking times, um, which signifies their interest and attention in, in a stimulus um, as well as the recognition of a novel stimulus or the recognition of an, of an unusual event. Um, and one of the principles of this method is that um, infants will look longer at events that they're surprised by. So I'm just going to take, just describe one well-known experiment to give like an example of, of what I mean here. Um, so this is a, a, an experiment by um, Lindsay Powell and um, Elizabeth Spelke on um, kind of early social cognition and what they did is they showed infants these kind of animated shapes so let's say they showed um, like three purple squares with with eyes and um, to make them kind of seem social um, and the shapes all the shapes either follow the same path of motion or one of the shapes um, engaged in like a different type of motion to the other two and they found that infants as young as seven months were more surprised when that that group member acted differently which they suggest is that we have this kind of early expectations that members of um, social groups will act in similar ways. Um, so that's just an example of um, kind of one of the ways in which we try to probe kind of early social cognition. Um, but yeah, I can talk a little bit about uh, more about other, because that's more basic, I suppose, examples of social cognition, but I can talk a bit more about other kinds of social information at different stages of development, if that's what you'd like to talk about. Sorry, my earphone just fell out. But it's fine. Uh, yeah, I, I, was I was just going to comment that, uh, okay, I asked you that question for a very specific reason, because mm. studies done on uh, young infants uh, are one source of evidence that people point to when they want to make an argument for the innateness of certain mm -hmm. traits, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, at the same time, there are, for example, studies out there done on, on children that are not even born yet. And it seems that they are already able to distinguish between their own mother's voice mm -hmm. and the voice of other people. So there you go. Perhaps we can even argue that even before people are born, they are already, at least to some extent, being influenced by social information. Yeah, and I think it depends on the type of um, social information that you're interested in looking at. Um, like, for there is obviously evidence that, yeah, newborns are kind of prone to follow and be interested in facial 
faces and face, facial like stimuli and, and have maybe some preference for familiar faces. Um, but if you're thinking of something like, um, like social communication, um, you might need to start looking. That might become increasingly more important for like older infants um, and toddlers when they're starting to learn to communicate. They pick up on kind of nonverbal communicative behaviors such as gesturing and they begin to use kind of basic utterances to interact with their environment. Um, however, if you're thinking of something like social identity, and um, children may not demonstrate understanding of this, and this not, not might really influence their behavior until a little later in development, when they begin to kind of recognize that they have like distinct desires, thoughts, and perspectives to other people, and they're like a distinct entity in relation to other people. And this is typically observed a little later around the age of four. So yeah, it really depends on kind of the social information you're, you're interested in. Yeah. And uh, in your studies, how young are the children or infants that you study? So I don't really uh, work with infants, and um, but this is uh, because I'm interested in kind of children's social interactions with others, specifically how that impacts their, their kind of cognition and specifically their verbal exchanges with others. I'm also interested in things like the development of social belonging, um, group membership, social behavior with peers. So I tend to focus on preschool and early schooling years, um, kind of before and the first few years of schooling. To investigate these social processes as children develop more kind of sophisticated conversation, conversational abilities and interact with others outside of their like core family unit. Um, so this is typically between the ages of four to seven years of age, although I have some studies with older children around 10 or 11 as well. But yeah, that's, that's the typical age range I look at. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, before we get into which specific topic you study, give us perhaps a brief timeline of the ages at which you study children for each specific type of social information they process and each specific psychological trait, I'd say. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so when you're thinking about things like social communication um, uh, and, and things like that, like even, you know, at, at age one to two, between one to two children are starting to, as I said, engage in kind of basic social interactions with their parents and, and others, you know, pointing to things that they want or, um, you know, demonstrating that, they, that they're that they seeking information about an object or seek, seeking information about something or, 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 or other um, like that. And then that obviously kind of develops into more kind of basic utterances where they're, they're you know, um, starting to name things, label things as, as they go through kind of that developmental period up until they can have kind of more full-blown conversations with their parents. So, um, and then in terms of things like social identity and, and things like that, I would say it depends again on the kind of social identity you're looking at. If you're thinking of something like gender, even like kids as young as two or three um, can start really talking about how they kind of understand you know their gender identity and understand how it's different from others but if you're thinking about maybe something like um, racial identity cultural identity ethnic identity that might um, kind of come online a little bit later uh, later on and um, we do see in general that by the age of five um, children are when thinking about social group membership specifically children are um, more particularly sensitive to social group membership at that point because you can even kind of assign them to very minimal groups such as um, kind of um, uh, assign them to uh, like a blue group or a yellow group and they'll be they'll show like um, biases against or they'll show preferences for their own group so it's kind of when when kind of groups and social groups are becoming more important for their everyday lives when they're when they're starting school and things like that that's when you can see that and they're becoming more sensitive to that information. Um, so I didn't really give you a specific timeline for one specific thing because I kind of study different aspects of social information, but um, I hope that was somehow helpful. Yes, of course. But let's start then with religious beliefs. So okay. does the family play any important role at all in transmitting those beliefs? And I mean, here, I want to be very specific. Uh, does the family influence the religiosity of children? That is, the, uh, does the family influence if they become religious or not? Uh, is, mm -hmm. that, is that what you study or do you study specific religious beliefs? So, um, yeah, we, we do. So based on research from myself and my collaborators, we 
believe that the testimony or claims that children are exposed to at home are very important for the development of religious beliefs, um, at least in childhood. But I will say that we, just as a caveat before I kind of talk about some research, we kind of look at um, religious belief really only in early childhood and maybe slightly later, 10 or 11. So I, you know, I, I don't really can speak to how it kind of affects their long term um, belief in religion. Um, so first of all, why we might think that um, parents or social, like cultural information is important for the development of relig religious belief is that um, religious beliefs are highly culturally variable in that they vary considerably in their strength and their content across different cultures. And so cultural transmission must be an important mechanism. Um, and you said kind of specific types of religious belief. I will say we don't, um, in our research, we don't really set out to look at a specific because we're not interested in yeah, a specific kind of set of religious or religious system, but a lot of the times just in the nature of the samples that we recruit, um, it is um, Christian beliefs that we're looking at. But we also have um, some, um, we also look at some data from um, uh, Muslims and also, yeah, families. Um, I think they're the, they're the main two kind of belief systems we've looked at so far, but we don't have, we don't kind of set out to look specifically at these, a specific set of religious beliefs. Um, but yeah, just to kind of, just kind of exemplify how parents might have a particularly influential role. Um, I'll talk about one study which is led by my close collaborator, Kelly Shway. Um, and Kelly and um, an amazing team of research assistants collected data from minority religious communities in the predominantly secular state um, of mainland China. And what they did is they separately asked parents and their children from these communities about their beliefs in different um, unobservable phenomena across the domain of religion and science and you know things like and when we think about religion things like God, God, angels um, and heaven and so on and what they found was a, a positive significant relationship between the beliefs of Christian um, minority Christian children and their parents and what was interesting is that they even found this relationship even among older children so 10 and 11 year olds who by this point have considerable exposure to other sources and also to um in their educational kind of curriculum to like very you know secular state curriculum basically um so at this point they're receiving a lot of conflicting information however they're still um kind of demonstrating religious belief and also there's a positive relationship between their strength of their belief and the belief of their parents so this shows that you know um at least in this in this context um what children are exposed to at home is quite important even when it goes against the majority kind of cultural view Mm -hmm. Do uh, are children innately predisposed to believing in unobservable entities? Yeah, that's an interesting question because you um, you might think if something is not unobservable, um, so you can't really see it, you can't sense it, you can't perceive it, you can't touch it, um, then you must need to rely on other information sources to learn about these things, um, and not so much on kind of your own naive theory about the world or innate cognitive um, dispositions. However, I will say um, some sc scholars do argue that humans are um, in fact innately biased to, for example, attribute causes of natural phenomena to a higher purpose or design. Um, so there are some early cognitive tendencies, for example, to believe that um, yeah, the natural world is designed to fit human purpose. So like rocks are designed to for us to sit on and um, there are some tendencies to which, which are, kind of relates to creationist views um however so i just want to acknowledge that there are some um theories out there that do argue there are um, innate kind of cognitive disposition, dispositions for these beliefs however from my um perspective in my own research i would say that cultural input uh, as i said before is quite important in shaping beliefs in, in the un unobservable um especially when you're not kind of you know, you're not coming into contact with these entities on an everyday basis. Um, for instance, like across um, cultures, adults and children are more confident that, um, so just to kind of talk a little bit more why I, I believe this. And um, so they're more, adults and children um, are more confident that scientific unobservables exist. So things like germs and oxygen um, in comparison to religious unobservables, such as again, angels and, and heaven and so on. And what we found is in the studies that we have kind of uh, runs so far is that parents systematically talk about scientific unobservables in a different in a distinct way to religious unobservables. Um, so we found that even in highly religious um, communities, 
parents are more likely to kind of modify their statements and use more cues to uncertainty and subjectivity. So it's things like, I think, I believe, maybe, might, perhaps, kind of. Um, whereas in comparison, this is quite rare for scientific entities. Um, so parents are more spontaneously kind of communicating more confidence in the existence of scientific entities, so not really qualifying their statements as much at all. Um, so this taken together, I guess, this suggests that children are being kind of are being exposed to these different types of discourse around different types of unobservables. And that could be important for the development of the confidence of their belief in, in these different types of unobservables. That's very interesting. So does that mean that even religious people do not deal with their religious beliefs and their scientific beliefs? Uh, they not treat them the same way? Um, so, yeah, well, it, it could be, I think even in some of these highly religious communities, first of all, it, we ha there has been survey data showing that um, even, you know, there's still kind of greater confidence in certain scientific. Now, these are more kind of familiar scientific entities, you know, think, as I said, things like germs, things like oxygen, yeah. um, in comparison to religious, where there's more maybe room um, for doubt, I suppose. But um, yeah, in a way, I think it, it, it really depends on what you mean about treat, if treating them differently. Um, but in the way that they're at least communicating and the kind of cognitive stance they're taking towards these different entities, um, at least from the pattern of talk that they're producing while talking about the different entities, it seems like they're they're treating um, religious entities with slightly more kind of acknowledgement of subject subjectivity surrounding them, um, at least in a, even subtle cues. Of course, this is not a this is not a blanket statement, but you know, um, not for every religious individual, but in, at least in the general patterns we're seeing. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I, I also asked you these two previous questions because there are some behavior genetic studies out there uh, focused on religiosity. And I, I mean, of course, there could be some criticisms to those studies, but the, it seems that by studying uh, twins, we know that uh, re religiosity uh, is heritable to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if that's true, then that could imply that parents uh, do not really influence, at least in the long term, if their children become religious or not, but they could influence if a particular child has a predisposition toward religiosity, what mm. they would influence is the specific religious beliefs mm. that they adopt. I mean, I don't know, I'm not sure if that would make sense to you or mm. not. Yeah, that's interesting. And it's interesting to think about like the interaction of these kind of cognitive tendencies or biases that, that we have and the cultural input that we're, we're receiving. Um, um, I do, I, I think there is some evidence as well that like, yeah, children uh, now I don't quote me on this. I'm, I'm kind of pulling this out of out of somewhere, but uh, or where um, children with kind of more tendency towards teleological beliefs, which is like beliefs that like um, uh, beliefs that um, the world yeah, as I said, a that purpose. there's a higher being that, yeah, that the, that um, every, things are, you know, there's um, purpose for for natural natural phenomena and things and and they're designed for for human purpose and things that um that is uh related to religious belief like the strength of religious belief in religious communities as well among among kids but um yeah that that's really an interesting possibility that um i have not really um explored i've looked because we're interested kind of in social learning mechanisms and cultural mechanisms and things i've looked mainly at what are the types of cultural input that could influence children's um, beliefs in these kind of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What yeah. about uh, parents' beliefs about their own influence over their children's religious and scientific beliefs? I mean, what do parents think about that? Yeah, so um, I can't really speak universally on this, um, but I, ha I can tell you some um, about some survey data that we collected from Iran, China and the US. And you notice that I kind of bring up these contexts a couple of times because this is part of like this broader cross-cultural project that I was working on for a few years. Um, but what we did is we asked parents um, 
open-ended questions about their influence. Basically, do you influence your child's religious and scientific views? Um, because often, I think it's a good question, because often the case we kind of just assume that parents are, you know, think they're influencing their kids when actually, you know, it's, it's helpful to actually ask them. Um, so we asked them, do they influence and like potential ways that they might enact this influence on children's views. And we found that both in Iran and, and the US, that the majority of parents thought they were pretty confident they'd influence, they did have influence on children's learning in both domains. Um, however, in comparison, fewer parents in, in China consider themselves to be a religious influence. And this is a mainly secular sample, so it makes sense that in this culture, religious values are not considered an important aspect of child rearing. Um, but yeah, it seemed to be the case that they, that they you know, at least in domains that could be culturally relevant, um, uh, parents see themselves as, a, as an influence. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, that, that's very interesting because it just reminded me of studies where people surveyed, uh, for example, we, I, I think, uh, I, I hope I'm describing this correctly, but I think it was women, uh, childless women, women with one child and women with two children uh, and the two children from uh, from different sexes, one male, one female. Mm. And uh, it seems that when uh, when women are and parents are exposed to children from different sexes very early on, they are more likely to believe research about innate gender differences, for example, mm -hmm. because, because they see that uh, from very early on, there are some uh, differences between their female and their male child. So, right, yeah, that's interesting. Um, that's really interesting. It's like, um, and then, like, also, it's interesting to think about like how parents think about. I, I know some interesting research about how parents think about like child development. Like their own beliefs about child development will influence how they kind of approach their child. So it's interesting to think about how um, kind of parents naive theory, theories of, yeah, psychology and child development might influence how they interact with their child. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how that might reflect on, on, on the survey that we looked at with religious and scientific beliefs. Um, but yeah, it's definitely an interesting, interesting idea. Yeah. Yeah. So moving on to another topic, mm -hmm. uh, of course, we tell stories to children. Do they really believe that <laughs> what they hear in stories can really happen? Yeah, so that's um, another interesting question. Um, so the research that I'm familiar with um, suggests that by the typically by the age of five, children are not prone to believing everything that they hear in stories. Um, and are able to differentiate between different types of stories, for example, are more confident that realistic, kind of more realistic, what I call realistic or historical stories are real compared to stories that defy causal regularity, such as events found in more kind of fantastical stories or magical stories. Um, however, children younger than five are not as reliable in making this discrimination when you, at least when you explicitly ask them, is this real or not? Um, maybe implicitly they're still understanding some things can't happen. Um, but yeah, in, in terms of the studies that have been run that, I, that I'm familiar with, um, it's typically kind of before the, yeah, around the age of five that children are reliably kind of discriminating between different types of stories. Mm -hmm. About the age of five? Yeah, I think I'm just thinking of a couple of studies um, uh, by my collaborators, um, at least reliably, you know, some kids might be doing that beforehand, but like on a group level, um, reliably it's like four to five where they're saying like these things can't happen and these things um, are able to happen yeah uh, and do you know exactly what are the kinds of elements in the stories that from that age on they stop believing in i mean the does it have to something to do with the fact that perhaps some are more familiar or down to earth mm. or even correspond to events that they directly observe? I mean, does mm -hmm. it have anything to do with it? Yeah, like, so, yeah, it might be that obviously the realistic stories might kind of concern with elements that they come into contact in their in their real lives. And I think definitely in this case, 
like children's own interactions with the world probably has an effect there. Um, in terms of like, so these more kind of fantastical stories, um, I think often what happens is we kind of tell in these experiments, we tell children a story where, um, I'm trying to think of something where, let's say, for example, um, uh, yeah, like a, a person turned a, a stick into a snake or like a fairy came along and with their magic um, made some flowers grow or something like that. And um, it's it, um, what often we ask is like, is this person real? Is like the protagonist real? So it, it's not, maybe it's, but there's, and a lot of the times younger children might might kind of consider because you're telling them about a person of course this person is real but because the person is set within this this world that where these kind of uh, magical things can occur other maybe slightly older children might be picking up well if this person can't be real because like these other magical things are are happening around them so it could be also that that um, older kids are also picking up on um, the broader cont contextual factors as well um whereas younger kids might be just focusing on like the person or the protagonist. Um, yeah, does that make sense? Mm, yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> no, okay. of course, uh, I'm not too much into that kind of research, but intuitively, I guess it makes sense. So. Yeah, yeah, it wouldn't be um, my domain of expertise either, but um, it's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's been an interesting kind of um, collaboration with some other people that have worked on some of these studies. Yeah. So another thing, uh, at what age do children start inferring causal relations? Yeah, again, so this is um, a topic that I'm interested in, but I wouldn't call myself an expert on, but I can um, definitely discuss one classic study by um, David Sobel and Alison Gopnik um, that investigated children's categorization of objects based on their kind of underlying causal powers, so their causal relations. Um, so they developed this paradigm and um, called the Blicket Detector Paradigm, where children view different types of objects, so let's say different uh, shaped blocks, um, and you place them one by one on this kind of rectangular kind of mechanical box. Um, and some of these objects make the machine light up and play music, so they cause an effect, and some do not. Um, and basically, the objects that make the blicket detector go off are called blickets. Um, so then children are presented with some um, novel, a group of novel objects, and some of these objects are called blickets, and some of them um, are, are not called anything, but they look kind of perceptually similar or even identical to an original blicket, if that makes sense. Um, and what they find and what they ask is with the new, with these new blocks, um, uh, which one will make the machine, which ones do you think will make the machine go? And they found that like children as young as two and a half, three years old, were more likely to endorse the cause of power of objects that were named blickets, um, no matter, and kind of, and kind of not pay attention to and kind of override this perceptually similar this perceptually similar objects I guess um, so even if even if a blicket was looked very different to the original blicket because it was named a blicket they were like oh well obviously there's something about that 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 sets the machine off so what it, it kind of shows is that children kind of at this point readily encode causal information and kind of prioritize it over other perceptual information when making causal predictions um, so there definitely could be other researcher out there uh, where even infants can kind of follow basic understanding, you know, basic um, follow, yeah, some basic causal relations, but um, I will kind of leave it at that. That's the study I'm most familiar with. And I think it's quite a neat one uh, as well. Yeah, are children influenced by verbal testimonies when it comes to drawing causal relations? Um, yeah, so this, as I may have kind of hinted at before, um, I think, you know, yeah, there there is kind of, when children are drawing causal relations about the world, you know, there's a couple of different sources that they can, or double, yeah, a couple of different sources that they can use to make their judgments. So um, obviously there's the evidence that they see for themselves, um, but also there are also a lot of the times when they're kind of, going about the world, they're also, you know, engaging in, in collaborative activities, with other people, interacting with other people. So they can also get some information from other, others as well and some verbal testimony, as you were saying there. Um, and 
what researchers found is that children are not kind of passive recipients of other people's testimony, um, but they often use kind of epistemic and social cues to infer the reliability of these information sources. So has this person been accurate in the past? Is this person an expert or someone I'm familiar with? Does this person seem confident in their testimony? Um, so these all of these things have been shown to influence um, kind of children's judgments and uh, and so on. But um, when thinking specifically about inferring causal uh, relations, um, I can just talk about one study that I ran with my collaborators, Kathleen Carbo and David Sobel. And what we did is we found that, um, what, what we did is we showed four and five year olds. Um, so yeah, we set up this thing, set up this, this study where four and five year olds heard a piece of testimony about causal relations. Um, so which block would make the machine go? They also viewed which block made the machine go. And they either heard a confident informant, so someone who was very confident versus a hesitant informant, so someone who kind of hedged their bets a little bit and were like, mm, I don't know, maybe it makes it go, you know, whatever. Um, importantly though, another kind of layer to this experiment was that the, the evidence that they viewed sometimes was deterministic. So this block always made the machine go or a block sometimes made the machine go. It was a little bit more unreliable. Um, and what we found was that five-year-olds, but not four-year-olds, were more successful in inferring causal relations when the informant was appropriately calibrated to the quality of the evidence. So, so in the case of deterministic evidence, they were more likely to learn from a confident in informant um, versus a hesitant informant um, when the kind of testimony what appropriately reflected the nature of the evidence, um, whereas um, when it was more probabilistic relations, so, so this block sometimes made the machine go, they were more likely to learn about these relationships when, when hearing kind of more hesitant testimony that acknowledged these probabilistic um, outcomes compared to a confident informant. Um, so what we conclude from this study is that the capacity to kind of integrate distinct sources of, of causal knowledge from verbal testimony, from children's own kind of observations, um, and integrate these kind of appropriately kind of emerges during the, the preschool years, at least in terms of, you know, this, this very um, basic understanding of how objects work. Mm -hmm. So another topic now, what mm -hmm. is mental state talk? Yeah. Um, so mental state talk, this is something else that I'm interested in and, and kind of well, I've been interested in this uh, mental state talk, and mental state understanding, I think from the beginning pretty much of, of my career. But um, so mental state talk encapsulates um, references to our psychological or our inner life. Um, and it's often used to discuss, you know, the beliefs, the desires, the intentions and the emotions that might make sense of an individual's um, behavior. So that's kind of how I would define mental state talk. Mm -hmm. And how is it developed? Does, do the parents have any influence over the development of mental state talk or not? Well, um, again, coming from my perspective, which kind of also draws from um, social interactionist theories of development, um, so this, this, this perspective does suggest that children's conversations with more expert partners, such as their parents and their peers and, and so on, has a significant influence on their language and social skills. Um, and there is indeed evidence from longitudinal research and intervention studies suggesting that increases in the frequency of parent talk about the mind. So when parents just talk about emotions and, and beliefs and things during storybook reading, for example, has an influence on children's developing mental state talk. Obviously there's other as with language development more generally, there's obviously there's other contributors, but this does have um, parents, the way parents, the quality of parent talk does seem to have, have an influence as well. Does that relate to theory of mind? Um, yeah, it does actually. So it's um, studies as well have been not only looking at the quality of parent mental state talk on children's mental state talk, but um, uh, I'm thinking of a recent meta-analysis actually by Virginia Tompkins and, and colleagues, which revealed that parent mental state talk also has a modest kind of significant influence on children's developing mental state and theory of mind understanding, such as their false belief understanding, emotional understanding, and so on. So it seems to also scaffolds their general, their social understanding more generally as well. 
so it's not necessarily the case that a theory of mind is not innate, but perhaps the way it develops is influenced by social inputs. Yeah, I think um, from this this research, it suggests that um, kind of encouraging children to talk about other people's mental states, talk about their own mental states, reflect on other people's social behavior in that way could um, definitely, yeah, it could lead to yeah, a more highly developed, I guess, theory of mind. Um, obviously it doesn't rule out the, the cognitive explanations altogether, but it definitely um, shows that we have to, you know, pay also attention to kind of social mechanisms as well. Mm -hmm. Of course, I, I don't think you've studied this directly, but do you think that um, stories and from the point where children can read that reading fiction could also help developing theory of mind? Yeah, um, I this is something I've become more interested in, kind of the, the influence of fiction, like media and the influence of um, kind of culturally diverse fiction and, and things like that on children's theory of mind, on children's kind of social behavior and so on. Um, but um, I think there is, from my kind of initial review of the literature, there there are, there is some evidence that um, children who kind of re read more and read, it maybe depends on the content of the stories, um, are able to kind of engage those with those like social cognitive muscles or social cognitive abilities um, when imagining you know these different people and imagining these different worlds and, and why are they doing this and you know and, and so on and that might have an influence on their social cognition and um, behavior as well um, yeah so how and when do children develop their in-group affiliation um, so I think we talked, yeah, I, I kind of talked a little bit about that. I kind of focused on that one when, when we were talking about like social information at the beginning. Um, and, and I also brought up this study um, that infants seem to kind of recognize group members and, and actions and things which might um, point to kind of these more, uh, perhaps more, more innate um, understanding of, of intergroup bias and social relations and things like that. However, um, looking at, um, there are, and there are a substantial number of studies that showing that young children kind of readily affiliate with people that they perceive to be socially similar to them, people of their own group. Um, they're more likely to kind of prefer with and interact and share resources with their own group. Um, and this tendency is observed even in societies where, you know, there's not much intergroup conflict, like there's not really a reason to be in different groups, you know, um, or even when group membership is, as I said before, is based on very minimal cues, like you're in the yellow group, you're in the green group, um, which does point to um, kind of the evolutionary value of belonging to a group. Um, and typically this is, as I mentioned before, this is kind of seen, you know, kind of starts to come online around four or five years of age, at least in the studies that I've looked at where, um, but it might differ obviously slightly across different cultures. Um, but one kind of caveat also, to talk about this is that a lot of this research is done with like majority status, um, majority kind of culture, kid in, in communities and children. And there are there are findings that children from minority status groups um, show more ambivalent preferences. So sometimes even preferring kind of high status outgroup members. So when I say outgroup members from other groups compared to their own in-group members. Um, so it might be the case that even though there are these kind of this kind, of, this kind of early emergence of preferring your own group, um, other social forces might impact on, on, on that on that development as well. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think there's good evidence to say that intergroup bias is something innate? Um, as I mentioned before, um, there there are like it, because as I as I mentioned that you know this this. Um, tendency to affiliate with members of, of your own group and socially similar others from a very pretty young age. Um, it does, as I said, point to perhaps uh, 
kind of the benefits, the evolutionary benefits of belonging um, to a group. However, when thinking about intergroup bias, it's it's kind of liking your own group is probably only one side of the equation. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sh so there might be some good evidence for in group affiliating with your in group based on um, innate explanations and so on. But when considering the development of out group dislike or hatred, um, that's kind of uh, the other side of intergroup bias, which is doesn't seem to be um, as ubiquitous, I guess, a, a phenomenon as in-group preference. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to in-group affiliation on the one hand and out-group derogation on the other, are these two things that develop uh, separately? Um, so there are different uh, debates and perspectives on this, but at least from my understanding of the evidence, it seems, it does seem so. Um, as I mentioned, before preferences for people who perceive to be who we perceive to be part of our group come online quite early um, and it's fairly consistent although I did give some examples of when it's not that consistent yet um, explicit kind of hatred or dislike or prejudice against another group um, either is seen kind of in more subtle forms later in development or it can vary widely depending on different socio-cultural factors such as like in a society, is there historical conflict between groups? Um, are there narratives about historical conflict that children are um, are being exposed to? And you know, in that sense, maybe using that to, to develop dislike for a group, or it might defend, depend on like an ideology of a specific community. Um, so overall, it seems that although in-group um, affiliation is, um, as I said, quite an ubiquitous phenomenon, um, out-group dislike seems to re rely more hev heavily on social learning, the nature of one's own social experiences with other groups and communication um, and so on. Yeah, so it seems that there are some sociocultural factors mm -hmm. that play a role in how people think and relate to out groups. Right? Yeah, I think that would be my um, understanding of the evidence to date, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what about the dehumanization? What is it and how does it relate to this sort of in-group, out-group dynamics we've been talking about? Yeah, um, so again, there are debates about how to kind of best conceptualize this phenomenon. Um, it's something I've worked on. I um, was interested in this phenomenon for my PhD research and um, one of the reasons I was interested in it is because it's such it's such a complex thing to think about, like what does it mean to be human? What does it mean not to be human? Um, uh, so, but for today, I just define it as the tendency to attribute fewer kind of uniquely human and mental state capacities to outgroup members in comparison to in-group members. Um, and when thinking about how it might relate to in-group and out-group dynamics, you know, there's been a body of work in social psychology suggesting that dehumanization um, can play a part in think, you know, in a broad range of social behaviors, harmful social behaviors, such as extreme acts of violence of groups between his, throughout history, extreme kind of um, acts of discrimination against certain groups, um, as well as more everyday instances of like prejudice and discrimination as well. Mm -hmm. uh, does it have anything to do with how children mentalize about people from out groups? Yeah, so I think um, mental state attribution is something that I kind of came to look at when I was um, first studying how dehumanization might develop in, in among kind of younger populations among children. Um, and after some study and after um, some reflection, I guess it's 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 consider. I think it's definitely consider it, it plays can play a part in dehumanization, um, although it's still unclear as to what extent and whether simply attributing fewer mental states to someone can equate to dehumanizing them. Um, for for example, we often, I'll just give a couple examples of why mental state attribution might not equal humanity. Um, we often mentalize about readily about non-human agents such as our pets. We care a lot about what, how, how they think, how they feel. And um, conversely, we might, as I was talking about before, kind of, um, parents' theories of child development, we might um, 
kind of attribute fewer or more basic mental processes to babies and young children, but we still consider them fully human. Um, and there's also certain contexts where we might put a lot of effort into mentalizing about outgroup members, um, such as in competition where we have to figure out what they're thinking and um, what their intentions are to try and avoid um, us being deceived and also to try and like win a competition and so on. Um, so I, although I, I do consider thinking about someone's thoughts and emotions is a helpful way to empathize and humanize them to an extent or individualize them, um, there are other in, um, psychological processes involved in humanization, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't there be some complications, I mean, about mm. the humanization when it comes, for example, to blaming people from other groups for things that we were victims of? I mean, th mm. doesn't, doesn't it entail that we have to attribute to them some sort of humanity to be mm. able to blame them for something because i i mean mm -hmm. it doesn't seem to be the case that uh, for example young children to whom we attribute mm. le less mental states or even other mm -hmm. animals that we are as prone to blame them of doing something mm -hmm. as when we talk about adults for example mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a really interesting question. I think, um, and kind of probably some of the reasons why I feel like the, this construct of demonization is um, receiving further inspection in recent years is um, because of that, because we often have to attribute some kind of humanity to perpetrators of crimes and things. Yeah. But um, I will say there there is like one theory of, of demonization that looks at, that might kind of, that tries to explain these things um, and and makes a difference between animalistic demonization, where you're kind of considering someone to be like less intelligent or um, kind of you know um, all these other traits that might be associated with animals in comparison to humans, versus a me mechanistic demonization, where people have are more agentic and have these like abilities to plan and 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 intend you know making yeah make these complex plans or, or and so on, but do not kind of possess other you, like human nature qualities such as feeling warmth and feeling empathy and feeling um, positivity and stuff like that. And there, I think uh, researchers um, from that perspective would argue that we might even perpetrators, we're still stripping them of some humanity where um, so we might be mechanistically demonizing them. Um, although I will say that yeah, so this is, might not be a perfect explanation and, and other um, kind of uh, people that would go against that view would say, well, we're just, we're just basically, we just basically attribute kind of pro-social intentions towards some people, anti-social intentions towards others and dehumanization doesn't really play a role at all. But um, yeah, this is why this is an interesting topic. I could talk about it forever, um, but I'll leave it um, at that for now. I hope that was a little helpful. Yeah, I also brought that to the table because I am, in fact, aware of recent literature questioning yeah. the humanization, yeah. particularly from certain philosophers. But I mean, because also some of their main arguments don't come to mind at the moment. So yeah. I, I will leave it at that. So. Um, <laughs> Um, one last question. Do we know of any um, evidence-based interventions to promote pro-social behavior toward out-group people? Yeah, so um, I, there's definitely, I'm thinking already of, of a bunch of different um, kind of studies, more basic studies and more applied studies. Um, but I think I'll plug just a few, just to kind of keep with the theme of, of this discussion, I'll plug a few studies that I'm familiar with and specifically focused on increasing children's prosocial behaviour um, by increasing attention towards their mental states, um, the mental states of outgroup members. Um, but there's definitely a lot of other um, evidence-based research and interventions out there as well. Um, that I'm interested in. But um, yeah, so first, um, some research by um, Gilly Serksman and colleagues. Also, I think Laura Taylor and colleagues have have um, have a paper on this as well, which suggests that perhaps intuitively asking children to reflect on an outgroup member's distress um, encourages children's willingness to help that child in a hypothetical scenario. Um, 
so the, I think they looked specifically at helping intentions and not really like actual helping behaviors. Um, and actually, I, I think Laura, in Nord Taylor's study, they looked at, um, they specifically looked at asking children to pay attention to a child who is seeking refuge with their family from, from the war in Syria. So looking within the, the refugee kind of crisis and uh, the context of the refugee crisis. Um, and another study that I'll discuss is actually one of my own with uh, my PhD supervisor, Harriet Over, um, where we were more interested in the effect of mentalizing more generally um, about our group members' behavior um, and not necessarily just empathizing with their suffering or their, or their distress, but just on an everyday basis, like just thinking more deeply about their behavior. Um, so what we did, like in the other studies, we used kind of a more indirect contact method. So we introduced children to a storybook. Um, and they were just like, and we said the people in this, the children in the storybook, kind of to set up the, the intergroup context, we said the people in the storybook come from a different country to you, they speak a different language, um, they might eat, eat different food and so on. Um, and uh, so, and in the storybook, they were just engaging in mildly positive and negative kind of everyday activities, such as like going to a birthday party in the playground, stuff like that. Um, and in one condition, we asked children just to reflect on the thoughts and feelings of the child in every photo, in every after every kind of um, picture. Um, whereas children in the control condition were just asked things like, where are the children and what are they doing? Um, and we found that children in the mentalizing condition were more likely to share resources. Um, so they were more likely to share some of their stickers with another member of um, that group in comparison to the control condition. So above and beyond just like pay, just being introduced to a cultural outgroup and paying attention to like their surroundings and what they're doing we found that actually thinking more deeply about their um behavior has this has this positive influence on um children's behavior however um although these indirect kind of methods of context contact have positive short-term effects i'm i'm not sure if i'd you know strongly say at this point, we should definitely use this as an intervention. I think there's a lot more research to be done um, on this. Uh, again, this, as I said, it was like a kind of a relatively light touch intervention and, you know, we only looked at short term effects and so on. Um, but I'd also be interested to see whether researchers can design and test more direct methods of contact, um, which I think um, you know, obviously indirect methods are useful because a lot of the times you can't really facilitate communication between different groups or um, they're kind of less expensive and easier to facilitate in the classroom and things. Um, but when thinking about it, actually direct methods of interaction with outgroup members and stuff is probably a more powerful route to go. Um, and I've been thinking myself about how we can maybe facilitate this using technology and, and, and different things like that, um, which we wouldn't have, um, you know, in, in the past um, and see, does this have more kind of sustainable, long lasting effects on pro-social behavior and intergroup relations more generally? OK, very well. So before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find your work on the Internet? Sure, yeah. Um, so you can, I have a website at the University of Kent and my, my research profile. Um, and there you'll find a list of my, um, you'll find just kind of, yeah, the, the topics I'm interested in and my publications and so on. Um, and then in terms of my, ac if you actually want to access the papers, I'd recommend ResearchGate as well. Um, and um, yeah, as well. And then also I'm on, on Twitter. I'm, you know, I'm a, a moderate user of Twitter, I kind of go on and off, um, depending on my mood. But uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll post any new papers on, on my Twitter feed as well. Okay, so Dr. McLachlan, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you and I've managed to not butcher your name. So yeah. <laughs> I was sweating there all the time. So thank you so much for taking the time. <laughs> Cheers, thank you. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like, hit the subscription button, all of those things you already know. And please consider supporting the show either on PayPal or Patreon. All of the links will be in the description box of the interview starting at $1 per month. So it would be a great help. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com.
I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters. Karen Litzke, and Blanchett, Perga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkwi, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Ginty, Zurtger Vosbo, Weingard, Rebecca Neuberger, Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Narcio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, Jorge Pinha, Phil Cavana, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Dugny, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W. João Eira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dramiti Grigoriev, Diego Lanonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Saima Fzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortes, Ursula Litzke, Denise Cook, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy and Trader in NYC. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Vengnagdam, Curtis Dixon, John Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Giddy, Sardus France, Thomas Trumbull and Noon Welder. And my executive producers, Michel Rogieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano and Bogdan Canivet. Thank you for all.